uh, Making Worlds uh, Bookstore and Social Center, uh, a space and a project devoted to um, abolition, autonomy, uh, ecological self-determination, and uh, the encouragement and the promotion of radical liberation projects um, in Making Worlds through um, uh, Black, Brown, and Indigenous resistance-based uh, histories uh, and contemporary movements. Um, uh, one feature of the, the space that I want to draw people's attention to is the Lumia Bujamal Community Reading and Study Room that we recently opened. Uh, that uh, is a place in the library, you can see it back there, um, that you can come in, uh, take books, uh, sit and read, um, uh, books stay in there, but it's a, it's a space to come and, and, and hang out. So um, uh, my name is Jack Radich. I am a, an advisory council a member uh, with uh, Making Worlds. Um, I am also uh, the uh, author of uh, Microfascism, uh, Gender, War, and Death, which was um, published with Common Notions, which is also connected to the space. This is a Common Notions oriented space. Uh, the offices are up there. Um, and, um, and it's, uh, uh, oh, okay, I mentioned, can we mention the Saturday event now? Or the... Uh, might as well do it while it's on Saturday. Yes, I brought it up. Yeah. Um, uh, so on, on Saturday, um, uh, you know, it, you want to get a second dose of Geo, um, <laughs> um, it will be here uh, well, with this book launch on um, anti colonial eruptions, racial hubris, and the cunning of resistance, an incisive study that reveals the fundamental paradoxical weakness of colonialism and the enduring power of anti colonial resistance. That's going to be Saturday at 4 p.m. Um, okay, so um, I think uh, I will move now to introduce. Our um, esteemed guests. We're very excited um, uh, to, to talk about uh, everyone, including the well, uh, book, um, uh, No Pasaran, uh, and the fascist dispatches from the world in crisis. Um, and it's edited by Shane Burley, and um, there's Shane. Uh, and uh, Shane, uh, if you, I want to get these right as we go through, Shane is the novelist in Portland, Oregon. He's the author of Why We Fight Essays on Fascism Resistance. And surviving the apocalypse from about 2021, and fascism today, what it is, and how to end it in 2017. He's appeared in a number of other anthologies and journals, uh, and is regularly featured in a number of media sites. Um, and uh, to his left um, uh, is Darrell Lamont Jenkins, uh, a founder of the uh, founder, but not a just the founder of the One People's Project, um, and a, I recently learned. You know, uh, does not reside in Philly. I'm such a Philly uh, person, is a living legend in Philly, um, but uh, that you're now based in New Brunswick or uh, somewhere around there. So, welcome. Um, and to his left, uh, Gio Mahar, who I already mentioned about the author of the upcoming book, but also um, the author of a recent book, The World Without Police How Strong Communities Make Cops Obsolete. Um, and uh, to his left, uh, Kim Kelly, um, who you uh, you all know from uh, being an author of uh, Fight Like Hell, The Untold History of American Labor. So um, the folks here assembled today are going to discuss the future of anti-fascism and the issues they cover in the book, uh, State Rep uh, Repression, uh, Global Struggles. Um, and for, I'll just end by, you know, there are always great um, reviews and blurbs, but um, uh, this one I particularly like this one line, um, and because I think it speaks to the struggle, and it's uh, uh, by Vicki uh, Oscar Wilde. Uh, quote, this is one of my favorite books. Sorry, sorry, yeah. This is one of my favorite kinds of book, an indispensable resource for creating a world where it would be useless. All right, uh, with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Shane and everyone else. Thanks. Well, th thanks so much for the project goes on. Can I hear me okay? Yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming out. Uh, thanks for waiting around and, and, and being part. And thanks to everyone here for being part of the book. Um, it was a long process, and I appreciate y'all being here with me. Um, the idea of this book really came from the fact that when we're talking about anti-fascism, people are generally talking about an incredibly narrow, narrow phenomenon. They're talking about what they see in places like Portland or New York, uh, Baltimore, a very kind of narrow understanding of what that means, except the reality is that the movements have actually been a part of social movement spaces for decades because they've needed a defensive element. They've always had to respond to far right movements, whether it's white nationalism that was dominant in the US or other kinds of far right movements. And so we're talking about this 
there's a number of folks that say, like, why has it been portrayed just as a one kind of American centric, one kind of subculture, one kind of demographic, and really it's a lot bigger than that. And so the idea was to have contributions. And I approached everyone and said, write whatever you want, basically. You know, if you wanted to write something, what would you write? And people came up with really wildly different things, and that was the starting point. And so we went a lot more international, personal stories, there's interviews, different conversations, and really different approaches to what we're talking about here. So I wanted to kind of talk with folks a little bit about their chapters to start off with. Um, Kim, I'll sickle you out first. So your chapter comes personal. What is your chapter about? What's the kind of conversation that you engage with David? Sure. So, hi. So, um, my chat, I, I came, when you hit me up about this, I had like 7,000 ideas and I did not do any of them. And <laughs> I ended up going with something more personal because something that was on my mind that was impacting me, impacting someone I love very much. One of my best friends, David Campbell, some of you guys might have heard about, um, <laughs> about what all went down, about his arrest and about the incarceration of writers and all the smear from the right wing. And, you know, the cops breaking his leg. It, a lot of terrible things happened to a very good person because that person opposed fascism and punched a Nazi in the most basic terms. And the cop showed up. I made it out, and he did. So the cop showed up, broke his leg, threw him in jail. He ended up spending a year of his life in Rikers. He was basically an anti fascist political prisoner. You know, the way that the situation he had been involved in went down, it was. In, in practical terms, on the same level as like a bar fight. Sometimes people get punched, sometimes fights happen. But because this was happening outside of a protest, this was, we were all wearing black, we were anti-fascist protesters. It was kind of obvious who we were and who the people we were opposing were. The DA kind of threw a look at him. He was facing incredibly serious charges. He was facing like five to seven years in prison. And so many other bullshit trumped up charges that were just completely inappropriate for the actual facts of the situation, on top of having his leg crushed and mutilated by the NYPD. Um, but he eventually ended up, he, he took a while to go uh, spend a city here in Rikers, and that's kind of the experiences he had in that setting is kind of what we talked about in the book. As someone who was going in there as like a proudly anti-fascist person who was very open about why he had gotten there and why he had done what he had done. And something that was really interesting about just the conversation we had, a conversation we've had otherwise, because like, you know, we've been talking about this for a really long time, is the way that the other folks he was interacting with and befriended and just kind of chatted right with responded to his politics and the ideas he was sharing with them and just the reasons behind why he was there. You know, so many people, he just said even some COs uh, had come up to him with like fist pumped him or like fist pumped him because they said, oh, we heard that you'd be a Trump supporter. And that was kind of a, that was a weird thing for him to experience to have someone who was actively, you know, uh, oppressing him, keeping him in a cage, and be like, yeah, good job, buddy. Like, the kind of distance there was kind of wild for him to work through. But, um, you know, we talked a lot about kind of what he he learned while he was there. He read a ton, he translated a ton, he corresponded with lots of people, he got a lot of support from anti fascists around the world. The uh, anti International Fund helped him out, helped him, you know, keep buying ramen <laughs> instead of him buying postage. A lot of people stepped up for him. Then he had a little bit of money waiting for him in an account when he got out. Because he did get out. Now he's he's in Paris living his best life. But um, yeah, the, our conversation book kind of just tackles what happened during that year and you know, what he learned, and what he learned about everyday anti fascism and sharing these ideas with folks that maybe hadn't come across his ideas before in that context or had time to think about politics at all because they're so busy engaging in survival. So he definitely came out of it different. And it was just so interesting seeing the way his perspectives changed and seeing the ways that one can live an anti-fascist life even when one is trapped inside a cage. So, yeah, I don't want to like spoil it. I want you guys to read it. He's also, he's written about his experiences too. He, he took up writing while I was in there. He's written some essays for like Slate, Huffington Post. He's working on a book project. Like, he's, 
He's a good boy. He's doing. <laughs> he came out of it okay, but so many people don't. So many people don't have the support he got, or don't have that kind of armor that being a political prisoner bestows upon you. So, and we talked about that too, and about the privilege he had. Like he's a white guy who grew up middle class and had an education. Like he ended up in a place that not that many people look like that end up unless they've done some really weird things. So we talked about how his privilege informed his experience too. It was just, I think it's a pretty good back and forth, and it gives you an idea of what it what it looks like when what, what happens when you go to jail for punching a Nazi. And I think we first talked about us. Yeah. We first talked about this about what it took to support someone on the inside and what like community support, what jail support really looks like. And it reminded me that I had a friend who was a Earth Liberation Front prisoner, and he, he sort of said like the deal is is that. I refuse to snitch, and the community pays me back by promising the support. Like that's the that's the inside outside deal that I've made. Like I know that I can. And then, like obviously, like you know, attorneys will tell you that it's going to be easier on you if you do this and that. It never is. Uh, but it's something like okay, I have to depend on people on the outside. And that's kind of part of what made it happen. You know? One of the things he did before he went in, because he's I love him, but he's in there. And he wanted to find ways to seem a little bit tougher. Like he talked to folks who had been inside and had some hits to give him, some ways to get by. He got some tattoos. And one of the tattoos he got was a broken needle, because he's a poetic son of a bitch. And he's like, oh, well, snitches get stitches, so I got a tattoo broken needle, I didn't snitch. Because there he was not the only person there that night. I was there that night. A lot of things happened that night. And no one heard about what else happened that night, because David kept his mouth shut. And so the rest of us took care of him because he took care of us. That's what community looks like, especially when you're engaging in activities that the state deems you know, unpleasant or unacceptable. You know, we we got to look out for us. Statue of limitations is up now, right? Yeah, I mean, if you wanted to, we, we can. We don't need anybody <laughs> dropping out of the sky. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he lives in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> he has a job at the room. He landed on the city. He's not coming back. Oh, I was worried about you. Yeah. Me? Oh, I'm the next lady. I didn't see that. Gio, where did your uh, chapter come from? I know it started as a speech. And one of the things we were talking about this just beforehand, I mean, it worked there, talks about the role of fascism in the global south, which frankly is just kind of erased from most discourse. So, where did that kind of come from? No, that's a good question. And it was a kind of funny chapter. It, it started as a speech I was giving, it started in the context of the Chilean rebellion. Which were mass rebellions, you know, absolutely, you know, intense street battles. Um, the goal of which was to overturn and rewrite what was essentially still and is still a fascist era constitution, right? Um, and it, it created this sort of like interesting moment to circle back around and think about a few things because there was this phrase that came out of the rebellions that said neoliberalism was born in Chile and will die in Chile. And, and so what I really wanted to do was talk about the into the, the sort of intimate connection between neoliberalism and fascism, right? Uh, about the fact that not only was neoliberalism tested out in Chile as a laboratory under the sort of heel of the dictatorship backed by the U.S. government. In other words, the idea of the so-called free market um, being, you know, something that had to be imposed in blood and fire, right? Which has always been true. If you go back to Marx's writings on the origins of capitalism, this was not the, you know, and Marx sarcastically says, it took all of this blood, torture, police torture, violence to uh, unleash what he calls, in quotes, the natural forces of the market, right? Because it's not natural, right? There's nothing natural about it. So just like in the 1500s, there had to be violence to impose capitalism in the first place, because no one wants to leave common uh, lands where you can produce for yourself and go work 12 hours in dingy factories where you might be bad. Um, so too with neoliberalism, right? Neoliberalism had to be enforced upon Latin America as a, a, a laboratory for what then, a decade later, was brought to the U.S., brought to Great Britain under, uh, under Thatcher. So thinking through that, that loop and thinking about the connections um, between uh, the two in relation to violence. And so the Chilean constitution that people fighting against was even more radically neoliberal than what we live on. I mean, it just had all of the things that are practiced here, privatization of education, land, water rights, things like that, built right into the institutional structure. So the strategy of the movements was to overturn that, 
to write a radical new constitution, which has been a strategy across much of Latin America since the sort of you know late nineties, mid two thousands, um, in Bolivia, Ecuador, Venezuela in particular, um, and to force that new constitution onto um, you know, onto the, the powers that be. Ultimately, the constitution was defeated. Right? It was it was written in a way that was admirable, and it was defeated by the right? by still very fascist uh, public. And the trajectory of fascism. A neoliberal fascism in Latin America is something that we need to be super aware of today. So it's incredibly present in the right-wing governments. Of course, you know, we're talking about Bolsonaro as the most overt and contemporary expression of that. But it's sometimes really hard to, uh, you know, to, to express this to, to people in the U.S. in particular. And it's not to say that it's worse than the homegrown fascism here, right? Because homegrown fascism here is the Klan, right? Homegrown fascism here is white supremacy, Confederate, you know, uh, um, you know, Confederates, neo-Confederates. Um, and in Latin America, it's not to say that it's worse, but we have to understand the fact that many mainstream right-wing Latin American political forces celebrate Pinochet, celebrate, you know, all this whole Bolsonaro thing, celebrated the Brazilian dictatorship as, quote, saving the country from communism. Right? And it's in that name, this radical anti-communism, radical capitalism, that they're willing to do a whole range of things, you know, unleash police violence and ethnic cleansing in, in, the, in the favelas, um, unleash uh, developers and bloggers to destroy the Amazon, to chase out indigenous, you know, un uncontacted tribes, all of this shit, right? And so we can't think about fascism without the money over this is part of, you know, the, the fundamental question of the chapter. And it moves through some of the other pieces that have to do with the way we think about it here, right? The ways that liberal democracy and the Democratic Party are here is absolutely complicit in fascism, right? Complicit in creating the conditions, right? Radical neoliberalism, you know, centrist neoliberalism, the European Union, NAFTA, you know, global integration, you know, um, the so-called Clintonite, you know, uh, you know uh, compromise with the Democratic Party creates the conditions for mass um, dispossession, of course, and mass discontent. And it's the fascists that are here to scoop up that discontent, right? To uh, swing it to the right, to take over parts of the country that the Democratic Party systematically ignores and refuses to engage with. Um, and that brings us to where we are, where we were in 2016, 2018, 2020. Um, so I think, you know, we're also talking about the ways in which liberalism, uh, centrism, um, facilitate and, and give rise to, to fascism. There's, a, there's kind of a colonial relationship between the way that, like you're talking about, that these certain like, economic or social realities are imposed on colonial projects and then brought back home as kind of a learning ground. So I was just writing a, uh, a chapter on the Anthony League, and one of the things that was really key was that British forces basically practiced on the pre IRA rebellions 1969, 1970, to then do the same thing against you know really mass actions in the British homeland. So it was like a testing that same thing, Israel and Palestine, and then they actually back into Tel Aviv to shut down protests and then using that to develop you know international training programs that people are using domestically here. So there's this sort of that relationship that helps culture the far right. But, but I think I told you that the question I always to get the most is how do you decolonize anti-fascism? And I'm not sure, you know, I think people are asking different things when they say that. Um, but what does that bring in mind for you? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and you know, and what you're pointing to is true, right? We understand these global circuits of common surgency, right? The fact that, um, you know, in a close relationship, you, you can't really talk about this without talking about the police, right? The close relationship, Stuart Schrader's book is really on this, the close global relationship between common surgency and police. In fact, they've always been kind of a two-way street. In fact, if you look at the you know the, the founders of the you know the Pennsylvania State uh, Police, have been you know colonial you know colonial uh, forces in the Philippines, right, or in Haiti, or occupiers in Nicaragua, and they use their counterinsurgency insurgency training and expertise to found police forces, to theorize police reform, to make the police more um, militaristic. And I don't mean that in terms of the, the armaments. I mean in terms of the way they understand themselves outside force operating outside and against the community. And in the longer history of policing, this, this is it, right? When people talk about, you know, say, well, U.S. police in the South came from slave patrols, U.S. police in the North came from the London model. Well, guess what? The London model comes from the Irish occupation, right? The, you know, the, the, the Royal Irish Constabulary. The Royal Irish Constabulary then trains forces that become occupied forces in Palestine police, which is the British colonial police. The Palestine British colonial police Almost, uh, you know, represent the prototype that the Israeli police have taken on directly and reproduced as the officials. So we see this global spread and complicity of the forces of order, 
and the forces of fascism, because you, you know the, the police are always operating hand in hand with white vigilantism, white terrorism, with you know, uh, and, and again, if we return to this sort of um, the inside of that, it always needs to be understood, which is to say, you know, the, the, the old adage that the U.S. doesn't need fascism, it has to mind, right? It, that's it will be draped in an American flag, right? You know, these kind of these kind of recognitions bear a certain truth because what we need to understand um, is the fact that this is always about both the overt fascism in the streets of Berkeley, California, um, and about the deep fascism of the state itself. Right? And this is a complex thing. I was in the work in a national revolutionary anti-racist organization. We had deep and um, powerful debates and conflicts, really deep conflicts, over how to organize um, uh, you know, against white supremacy and fascism on a national level, right? And some of us are saying, well, what, why are we focusing so much energy and taking such risks to fight some knuckleheads in Portland when we need to be fighting white supremacy and the police and the prisons in the South, right? And I think you know, that's not a, a sort of easy conclusion, and it points to the fact that both of these things are incredibly true, right? Both of these things are deeply uh, you know, um, imbricated with one another, right? The open fascism of what we were seeing, particularly in 2016, was the sort of tip of the iceberg of something that exists on a far, you know, deep level. And I think one of the main challenges that we confront today is how to understand and struggle against both levels, right? Why? Because the Democratic Party has embraced the struggle against the far right. Three percenters, the Proud Boys. I will shed no fucking tears if any of them are strong enough for in prison. Um, however, the Democratic Party is also engaged in this sort of like consolidation maneuver around the structures of the state and institutions, right? The FBI is good, the Supreme Court is good, the institutions are good, and the problem of Trumpism is not that it was white supremacist, the problem of Trumpism is that it was outside of the institutions, right? And so we need to be able to fight both and, and, and do so in a way that prevents us getting trapped in the Democratic Party. So, yeah, there's sort of like this seductive quality to the idea that we can use the police against our enemies. You know, I saw people flip really big around the FBI investigations, Oath Keepers, Brown Boys, I mean, God, and Marvel. Um, but this notion that like maybe they can be used to suppress them as if that's what will happen. And like historically, even when there's like these really strict prosecutions done against far right groups that happened all through the 80s, the exact same model was then used on the left. So it was basically, um, and it's really innovative moment where they were able to figure out. And then right now, there's like whole coalitions of volunteers that are streaming through videos and live streams from January 6th and showing the FBI this is how you track people on social media so you can charge them with things. Um, that's not like they're going to forget how that happens. And so that will now become like the new model for intelligence and FBI. Um, well, I guess the fear is totally different, Daryl. Or at the end of your chapter, which is sort of part of the uh, one people's project story. So, where did your chapter come from? Um, and how did that kind of lead you to form one people's project? Well, it's funny because um, I see, as you're pointing out, George, that uh, a lot of what formed one people's project and what you're speaking to is um, actually a pursuit of showing everyone where those connections are between the mainstream right and the, uh, and the French because they were apparent to those who were after them all the time, but not so much to uh, you know the general public. So what um, so what we were initially trying to do was just showing those kinds of connections. Like one of the things I've always pointed out is that you know you like to say we had the plan back in the day. I mean, but when plans started catching hell for real in the sixties, it's interesting how we immediately shifted into. Um, complaining about police brutality. We went from complaining about lynching to complaining about police brutality just overnight, it seems like. And I think that comes from the fact that when we showed ourselves to be um, effective against uh, those kinds of the clannish elements, the you know, Nazi elements, uh, the um, white supremacist elements, when we showed that we were effective against them, then it was time to play cover. Then it was time to readjust and rebrand what it is you've been doing for decades, for generations. <clears throat> and that's where it really is coming. And uh, so we really um, are fighting the same battles that we have always been fighting. 
um, they just went from white sheets to blue, to blue uniforms. I mean, that's always been said. That's always been said. One people's project's job is to show it, not just with the police, but also with our um, people in power, anybody in power, be it in government, be it in um, commerce or I mean, in the industry, um, in education. Because that's one of the things that's really important to remember is that when we um, pursue this, we're looking at college professors. I mean, we got Amy Wax over at UPenn. That's her name, right? Yeah. Amy Wax and UPenn, mm -hmm. who basically personifies exactly what I'm talking about. Um, we have um, Godfrey, um, Paul Godfrey. Um, I forgot what is a small college um, in the middle of PA. Um, no, no, that's Virginia, but he's here in Pennsylvania. Um, he's the guy that coined um, the term alternative right and coined the term baby or conservative. How did I find out about him speaking at a Council for Service Citizens Conference? Mm -hmm. Council for Service Citizens being the white supremacist um, organization. So you see all these elements, and you can give a lip service all you want, but once you start showing people exactly what it is that we are talking about, then they say, okay, we got you. Now we can relate because that affects me. And then comes the other part, because you can do all kinds of education. You can educate people, let them write about the things that are going on in today's society. But without application, it's meaningless. At some point, you're actually going to have to do something about it. That's what we have the problems with the Democrats. We are showing you who the problem people are. What are you going to do about it? Well, they have their freedom of speech. OK. Now they told you that they want to take yours away. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> they're using your, their freedom of speech to tell you what they're going to do to you. Um, well, the best way to fight hate speech is with more speech. OK. So speak out against them. You should just ignore them. <laughs> And that's when you realize that you're alone in this when you're trying to deal with mainstream Democrats or mainstream liberals to begin with, because um, if you haven't noticed, they have another agenda. Um, and they look at those elements as bad as they are as a means to an end. Because as we have seen with the, uh, with the conservatives and the right, um, they have lots of money. And you know, when it comes to government, when it comes to mainstream politics, when it comes to mainstream period, money is going to rule, rule, rule the world. Cash rules everything around. And uh, so, being that cash doesn't rule everything around us, all we know is that we got to get things done. And that's where um, my chapter comes in, because we have to apply. We have to do something about these bad elements, especially when they are in our presence. Um, and in 95, even before I even heard of anti-racist action, I mean, that was a couple of months later. This was in January 95. And we had to deal with the situation in my hometown of New Brunswick, New Jersey. Actually, my hometown is something said New Brunswick, New Jersey. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, and we handled it. Effectively, because I never, well, um, it's not like I never saw them again, but um, as years went along, I found out that they wrote a song about me, but, uh, um, but, but it was for other reasons, not because we caught them some grief when they came to town. Um, but that's how we handled things back in the day. That's how um, Palms and Skins um, just said, look, you may, be, uh, you may get passes in other parts of the world, in other parts of this country. But not here, not in the Palms, not in any, not, not amongst us, not in this zone. We're telling you, we're asking you nicely to leave. Um, when we spoke in Brooklyn, um, I mentioned um, a couple of groups, and and I was reminded of something by uh, by our folks because some of the groups that I mentioned were not the most. Uh, we're not on their praxis politically. <laughs> you know, they, not all of them were on point, 100%. So I have to make the point here that at that time, a lot of the folks that were dealing with um, them in the streets that way 
were doing it all down the pencil. They were really just doing it because, hey, you're a Nazi, you have no business amongst us. And that's just the way it is. But a lot of them are still white women. I mean, there's a lot of work that we still have to do with a lot of folks. I mean, I'm not going to mention any names because I don't think that'll be fair. But um, but the truth of the matter is, this is where it is, it, the application that we display as we go forward will help to inform others how we should conduct ourselves as a society. So you're out there. You don't have to judge. It's not going to be just about slapping Nazis around. I'm supposed to be notorious for getting this right. Other Nazis also get out of that one. See. And um, and that comes through the fact that you know a lot of them, a lot of them come from some very dark corners of our society, and the wrong people got to them. Um, now you recognize the fact that they're still dangerous along to just to society as long as they're a part of that crowd, and even after they get out of that crowd, they still have a lot to atone for. Many of them do, um, but but by the same token, um, it's okay to recognize that humanity. They have to recognize that humanity, however. You try to tell them, you try to show them that. Um, don't kill yourself trying to show them that because your obligation is to the people that they can hurt first. Um, but if they start feeling like something's wrong, yeah, sure, you can help them out. You can be there, you can be cool and recognize that it could be the yes in you and they may not be as strong as um, you would like to be, but still. But see, that's part of the application. There's a lot of ways that you can basically um, move forward as Antifa, move forward as people, um, that will help mold and shape the bottom line. You can see the right way, flipping out the way they have over the past seven years. They're telling you that they're doing a good job <laughs> and we got to be doing it. And, you know, I can talk about that. I interviewed Mike Crenshaw, who's one of the founders of Antares' Action, um, and he was young and Antares' skinhead. Um, and they, and we had talked, I've talked to him about this a lot about the past day, right? But there wasn't a lot of politics going on here. It was very much this is like punk rock neighborhood clubs. There's Nazis coming in. They're recruiting sometimes the same neighbors. They're, they're starting fights at venues and they have to do it. But, but the actual work of doing that, that wasn't really cool. And that wasn't really cool. Was that kind of your experience? Was that actually being a part of that work? So changing or building politics for Yeah, but it, I, think, I think with me, it was always for me, um, I don't want to necessarily say politics, even though that's what exactly what it was, but it was more principle than politics. And I said general principle earlier, but I think how I felt about my life, how I felt about my society, is what motivated me to be the kind of person that I want to be now. So how I um, how I view Nazis, um, you know. I didn't, how should I say? I didn't go to the politics of politics came to me. Really? I mean, I already know, knew how I felt. Yeah. And I just simply found the avenue in which uh which best suited me. And boy was that trip. <coughs> Excuse me. Because um when I started out, um, when I started getting involved politically, um I was actually, um, I was a kid. I mean, I was studying, I was learning history about the various moves, and I just simply wanted to be a part of them. I wanted, I figured, hey, look, this is something that I think is going to best suit me as I go forward in life. And I want to be a part of it. I want to help this along. But by the same token, I also wanted to do a lot of things besides all the topics or um, political advocacy um, had to be secondary in my life. I had to have something to fight for. Um, there, I mean, I never mean, mind the fact that I had to consciously think that. I did have something to fight for. And I wanted to find a way to make sure I could fight for it. Um, so, you know, when you're a kid, you're learning um, and studying um, in school. Basically, going through the regular road to Main Street, and that's the way to go. Um, so, when my father suggested that I go into the military, I said, Sure. And they were coming in hot, <laughs> which was not exactly the best thing for me because, and then again, yes, it was. Because 18 years old, going into the military as a police officer, 
helps me to understand exactly what life was about. If I already had the uh, the notion that I thought um, growing up that um, or where I wanted to go in my life, I knew that was it. I never had any problems with the gospel. My father moved us out of North the day I was born, and I grew up in the suburbs. So I grew up nerd, you know. I go into the military, and that is when I start hearing the rumble what's wrong with me. But I'm not hearing it as much as I was hearing what was right with me, at least when I was in the police. And it wasn't even just that. It was also um, how they treat women. Because that was one of the things that um, I started noticing, too. I mean, and it really did impact on me. Um, because I remember when he was talking, uh, a group of us were sitting there talking about um, a guy um, and a woman, a couple. Um, he was always beating up on her, and she wouldn't be, you know, that kind of not, that kind of nonsense that keeps going on. It drives me nuts. But what drove me nuts while we were talking, and I used to hear this a lot when I was in the military, that um, somebody would just pipe in when, I, when someone says, "Why doesn't she leave?" Someone goes, "Oh, well, maybe it's because that makes her feel cared for." We that a lot in 1987. And it sounded weird to me then. Um, but then you start hearing more and more anti, but really misogynistic crap going on in the military at the time. And um, it didn't really resonate seriously with me. I mean, I, I, I remembered it, but it really didn't start hitting me until I started reading. Started listening to, believe it or not, we'll be over it. Started saying a lot of things around the time. Because she was really, uh, hey, you go to a door. <laughs> if the door is open, just go through it. She was opening up a door, and I was listening. I was also, listening. I was also reading a lot of Dick Gregory, his books from the 60s. So, um, and that was helping a lot. And August 11th, 1988, Hampton Coliseum, the show that changed my life. Spencer Sonic. Um, I actually was in the Air Force with somebody um, whose brother was in Spencer Sonic. Um, EPMD, Public Enemy, DJ Jackson, Jeff and the French Prince, and Frank DMC. This was a show that changed my life because when Public Enemy hit that stage, <laughs> I knew I was in the wrong business. I got kicked out in about six months after that. <laughs> Um, and uh, and I immediately started getting involved with what I really wanted to get involved with. Um, the first rally that I went to was that's a rally for after what happened to Yusuf Hawkins. Yusuf Hawkins was murdered by uh, the white mob in Bexner's Queens, and uh, that was really what was getting me going. I was meeting people, I was talking with folks, I was with the Young Communist League at that point, but that was really wasn't a no, that wasn't the direction I was going. I mean, it was a, it was trial and error, and, and eventually, I just realized there's a lot of stuff that I just have to just sit back and just watch how everybody does things on both sides. Um, sorry for using that term, but uh, but that's how eventually I started getting into anti fascist work because and, and also getting involved into anarchism because I saw a lot more application in those areas and the things that I wanted to do. And I was also in the scene. I didn't get back then. I was also still um, going to shows. I was videotaping shows. I had tons of videos um, that, um, that just I, that I can just reminisce about for years, for years to go on and on and on. But, uh, but the bottom line is uh, um, the 90s was my time of education understanding about how things are supposed to go. 2000, I was up, 2000, that was when we started saying, okay, let's make this. But it all be, well, it's not it. So that was exactly. I think my own little thing to do, I, I think I've done a few of these events now, and we've been talking about a lot about what it means to look at social movements, organizations do with that. Because a lot of people want to know how to do it. I've never had this experience in 2020. Things kind of merging. Movements 
that we're doing new organizations for me. People just trying to figure it out how to do So I was in Portland, you know, there was the mass uprising with everybody else, the last day in Portland for over 100 days. But right before that, it seemed that what allowed that to happen was new organizations for me. But then they were able to actually sustain the protest and reproduce it, apparently. Uh, it wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for, you know, about four or five testing groups that were doing like food. Distribution, I think they did about four million dollars in mail uh, money raising. It was really significant. Uh, but they did say they just tried to do it before. And then when the board part happened right thereafter, which really took part of the state, it was like a really big crisis, those groups funneled right in there. But they also brought in really mass recognition and that batch of actions when they did happen. So I uh, looked at the back to blue values, which are incredibly black. I think 
about these folks in Alabama, these coal miners that I have been on the strike for almost two years now. This is about 45 minutes outside of Birmingham, very conservative, traditional, religious, red, pro Trump, whatever community that's also deeply tied to their union and are on strike against the coal bosses who are backed by Wall Street venture capital. It's kind of a classic case. And going down there, we can um, out a little bit. And people that say, Lord, talk to me when I first showed up. But I kept showing up, I kept listening, I kept talking to good people. And yeah, we would argue a little bit about politics, but it was, we found a way to sit on the ground of labor, of unions, and talk to each other and kind of get through to one another. And I think one of the most important things that's happened in the strike and it's unfortunate for the sport anyway, too, is that the only people who show up those workers who are paying away for a cup of coffee store, you know, blue collar, Alabama workers going up against Wall Street, or whatever. that would be cut. But they're the union. So that is not going to work for that audience. The Republicans in the next state, which is all of the official school crickets, but the Democrats haven't really shown up to them either because they're in a lost cause. They're not going to vote for whatever Democrat, you know, claws their way onto the ballot and roll out the ballot. So the only people who showed up are the socialists and the radicals, local DSA chapters, labor folks from around the country. That was, that's who showed up and provided support and motivation, solidarity. And I think there are people I know that started out like I'm a conservative Republican. I got all kinds of dumb stickers on my truck. Some of these dudes, they're like. Quoting Eugene Debs on Twitter. Like, one of them had a meeting with Bernie and, like, gave him a hug. Like, there's been so much movement in the way that some of these folks who have a very specific worldview have shifted. And it's because of who showed up, because of mutual aid and solidarity and radical people, anti fascist people showing up and being like, look, we can argue about some of your bullshit later. As long as you don't say anything that crosses the line, we're going to show up and help you because it's us against them. In this case, it's us workers against them, the forces of capital, the, the, you know, the evil rich people that are letting their children go hungry. But I feel like that's something that can be translated into the us against them of people who are decent and fascists. I think there's just so much to be said for showing up and finding a way to connect with people on their level, not allowing any bullshit to slide, but recognizing that sometimes you're going to disagree and sometimes it's not the end of the world if no one's actively being harmed at that moment. You know, like I've had to kind of make, I struggle with it a little bit because I've heard some bullshit down there. And I'm like, how much do I want to push back on this? And sometimes I do, and sometimes I'm just like, something like that. You know, like it's, it, I don't know, like it's been interesting being around, like, <laughs> when I started going down there, I always joke, the be serious of the last time I was around this many Trump supporters was at Christmas and my grandma's house. So maybe I'm predisposed to not having to deal with that sort of thing. But it's like a lot of answer your question. But I think so much of it, especially in a labor context, is just kind of recognizing opportunities to show up. And if you're bringing coffee and donuts, maybe don't bring newspaper, but you can bring your perspective and you can talk to people, connect with people, and people notice who shows up. And we can't, I mean, this is something that we've heard about like this work that the plan would go through and feed people in poor rural areas, poor white areas. That's how they would build connections there. We need to be doing that. We have infrastructure that we can live We have union halls. We have groups of people that have trucks and fridges and access to like, you know, Walmart. Like, we can be that. We can feed the people and care for the workers and also use that as an opportunity to inoculate against fascism and push back against fascist ideas that are going to take root. And they would just need the motivation to do it. And it's not going to come from any leaders, but as rank and file workers and organizers, there are opportunities to kind of push this whole front agenda. It's just, it's, people take advantage of, you know, like, Maybe we're not willing to bridge anymore and we can park some day around, but we can still be radical. We can still push back against fascism, even if we didn't have to deal with these people trying to force us to vote all the time. Yeah, and there's this uh, organization in Oregon called the Rural Organizing Project that I think was created out of the anti-Klan network in the 80s and 90s. It was 
kind of an offshoot of that. And they would go into a lot of schemes. I mean, and if you need to grow up rules and you can, like, you know, I think they go into some areas where they, there's no high speed in it, there's no ambulance service, things like that. And coaches would come in, they're like, hey, Google Drive you to the office, you know? We'll set up food delivery, do all these things. Um, we'll also take you on anti migrant patrol because they're coming over the border with Canada. You know, they do, they make these things up. So, what the Lower Gas Project did is uh, help them set up a community center, help them do a newsletter, create phone trees, got to set these things up with the neighbors. And then, about a year in, the woman who invited the militia in wrote a, a column saying, I'm officially disinviting the militia, we don't need them. Yeah. And it was, but the reality is that, like, we've actually disinvented you know, a lot of those states. We don't go in there and communicate with them. And, like, it, obviously, it's shame because if we're not there, we're organizing with them, somebody else is. But also, I think the reality is that a lot of like the real communities I've been in do mutual aid better than like the urban capital spaces I've been in. They get to know people, they can feel like emotional investment in each other, and that's like something we can really want, you know? Something that I've come across as being a labor guy in the world, but also like an actually an interpersonal in the world, world. I've seen almost not like, I don't want to say the same, but I've seen when we talk about, oh, like maybe we should talk to some unions for this action, make sure that. So many people are like, oh, well, why bother? Like, they're just, either they're all Democrats or they're just like old white guys, or like they won't care. It's like, well, the most common type of person that you can remember in America is a black woman. Yeah. Like, it's you can do so many things. And the labor movement has so much useful infrastructure built up over centuries of struggle. Like, we got foundries, we got space, we have people. It's just, we need to do something with it. And not, Radicals can't just write off all the reasons as like some Democrat bullshit. Or like guys like my dad who have very bad political opinions but join the union when they're 18. Yeah, like it's, there's a lot of room in there to explore. I think we kind of cut ourselves off at the knees if we just like all that. Yeah, and so there's friends that were sharks that are seen as against racial prejudice when they're teenagers and they were all in the building grade, but so did a bunch of neo Nazi groups. Right? And, and there's protecting decades of being in the same union, right? So there's been this battle that they've had. And they've done all kinds of things. Like, they, it's basically a contested space. You know, they've organized shop stewards to few refuse to represent, you know, like uh, members of the DOC or other like white supremacist gangs or to make a shop for safety issue. There's all these kind of battles that are happening. And, like, right now, like, one of like, the underreported stories is like, rank and file teamsters are trying to kick the cops out of all kinds of locals. You know, uh, or the same with Ask Me, uh, public sector workers, you know, or like librarians are like boycotting their views until they kick the cops out. So, like, that, it feels like I'm like, that, those are real struggles, and they're going to have material consequences here. Like, something is actually going to happen out of that. Um, I, I've been thinking, I think, also, what we to do here, like, this idea of international solidarity around that, that that's just my find really. Confusing to figure out like what the tactile options are, and I think maybe that's actually just true in general. I remember having this debate actually at Bring a Ruckus conference like maybe 12, 13 years ago, uh, where I was like, I can't, you know, some of, some of the, the the campaigns people were talking about, I can't just see like you just kind of draw me a picture here of how this works. I that I was in tenant work, I get that, I can see when that works, but it's still part. Of it. So like, what, how do you think international solidarity plays with that that actually work? No, it's a it's a really good question, actually. You know, bring the right to the nation didn't do international work, right? In part because we said we're doing strategic work that is located where we are. And also because it allows you to avoid a lot of really acrimonious debates on the left about how to relate to global struggles. But I don't think it's a tenable position. And I think, you know, if we're getting back to the previous question of how to decolonize anti fascism, we have to understand that fascism is, is imperialism. Imperialism is fascism. Well, colonialism is a form of fascism. But we know from any society that. Fascism and its techniques and its technologies was tested out again in the laboratory of Southern Africa, in the laboratory, and you know, the, if we're talking about the emergence of, of concentration, concentration camps, right? The emergence of the categories of uh, total and even dehuman and dehumanization that come to be the fodder for um, for uh, for fascism. That comes out of the world. And so we can't then step back and draw a line at our borders and act as if we could possibly understand fascism based on what's happening. Or again, I mean, I mean this is not character, but like based on what's happening, say, in the Pacific Northwest, right? Without understanding how to anchor in, you know, questions that we've been writing. 
questions that then extend beyond the board assembly. Right? That the clan had a board, right? In the, you know, in, in the South as well. That, you know, CBP and ISDA today are fascistic organizations whose members are also borderline fascists. Um, and that that's, and that that's not accurate. How is it that we can have any fascism? And imperialism is one question. Two projects of decolonization, two thinking through um, contemporary struggles for land back, you know, domestically, but also global struggles for, uh, you know, again, you know, struggles against um, U.S. imperialism, or struggles against sort of global structures. Uh, not easy to connect those, but there's no way I think that you can conceptualize the struggle against fascism without, without having that as a yeah, I think we're talking about international collaboration on their side anyway. I mean, particularly in areas where there's far right, where the price is a little bit different here. But I mean, in my talk in your chapter about the coordination between the nationalists and basically religious Zionists and West Bank settlements, right? Which seems like worlds apart, but they're really not worlds apart, right? And they actually they, they get the alliances really big time. And there's a sort of far right national populist international forming. With money changing hands and organizational infrastructure to put back into the US. And it has the effect of actually changing US politics, like for example, CPAC being held in Hungary recently, basically with the head of saying, okay, this is like this is the vanguard to the right of the movement. And just like happened in Israel, where far right parties literally influenced who the mainstream party is happening kind of back here. So there's that back and forth relationship. No, absolutely. It's important to understand that Trump wasn't alone, right? Trump was part of a few people, I'm sure most people in the room, um, you know. You know this, the Trump is part of this broad R right alliance, you know, comprised of former president of the Philippines, you know, uh, Norway, India, um, Bolsonaro, Brazil. It's very hard for people to understand a uh, global fascist white supremacist network that involves people who maybe wouldn't be categorized as white in the US. And yet, those conceptualizations of ethnic superiority, of what uh, religious class superiority, are built into one kingdom. They're also all on um, radical assumptions. They're all built on radical conceptions of dominance. Um, for the most part, um, although this interesting relationship with the, the sort of fascist base, right? Um, and they and, and they all anchor that in around nationalism. But you get this, so you get this global alliance, right? Also, now was the closest to a Trump that we see. Um, they all, I mean, they would be in Brazil, just like Trump, for the first promise, right? Unleash the police and free their hands to the which in Brazil has already killed thousands of people every year right? in, in the process of that. Um, in the Philippines, the people famous in the US in the former president were able to do that. Um, same thing when the police killed every single drug through the direction. Right? That was a promise, right? Just sort of exterminate them. And this is the sort of strongman, uh, sort of misogynistic, and radically anti communist, um, radically pro capitalist fascism that emerged in the sort of coalition. Um, and it's important to understand how. Right. There was funny moments, right? I mean, as he goes back to you know uh, Nazism, right? Like how you have a fascist internationalism, right? How does Hitler get along with Mussolini? Not very well in certain ways, right? They both believe in their own sort of like nations, um, and and they don't necessarily want to share that. Uh, um, and, and so you have something similar, particularly around Ukraine, right? Which is like where do where do the fascists come down on Ukraine in this sort of attempt to build a far right you know, solidarity, especially when you have fascists in Ukraine and then you have fascists. Know, in you know in alliance with Russia fighting on sort of both sides of this war um, and those Eastern European particularly international solidarities are divided along our lines. So the funny and again this has direct resonance with what we're dealing with here, right? All of the weird sort of Richard Spencer, pro Putin, you know, turn toward Russia kind of stuff, which again entered into this kind of crisis around Ukraine as well. Um, that's all built on these global networks, Steve Bannon and others, developing these global networks to build this sort of black chain match. But again, we can't abstract this away from things like colonialism and white supremacy, or think of them based on a pure sort of US you know, based framework, or we don't understand why. Yeah. Uh, Daryl, how do you actually work with other organizations as one people project? Like, what kind of lines have you tried to build as a work? <laughs> um, I think the most important thing that one people start to know that we're, we're done, we're reported, researchers. So it's pretty easy for us to connect with uh, folks who are willing to want to meet the information. So 
we try to build a um, um, network of those who are a need the information uh, or trying to, we're trying to um, report to. Um, and that's the, really the general public in many respects, but we got to the right. We try to connect as, um, as we all work together, we try to connect primarily with those who are also doing the work. Um, whether you're talking about the Southern Poverty Law Center um, or Unicorn Rally or um, Atlanta Handy Fashions, or it's going down. We all work together and um, and to the point about the um, about the global connection, the global networks on the right, we need to make those connections as well. Um, <clears throat> but we've been also working with um, every journalist in um, in various parts of the world, whether you talk about Ireland, whether you talk about the UK or or Ukraine, or and in Ukraine we try to give the advocacy we prefer to actually just uh, listen to folks that are on. Get reports from folks on the ground as opposed to folks in the West who have a whole bunch of other things going on but can't really tell you exactly what is going on. They can. So, and that is important for us. Um, the best way to fight a lot of the um, the networking that's being done on the right is building the network on the left. And we have shown more often than not that we are a lot more effective. And uh, I think that scares them more than anything. We start building that kind of anti anti fascist network, or we built because we used to have, um, then uh, a lot of the stuff that we have been dealing with will be easy to deal with. Um, I mentioned in Brooklyn, and it actually came up on Twitter from someone else. Um, I, I expressed my frustration with the fact that we had met in the immediate time. Um, I was told by somebody who was on. Um, in Brooklyn, or someone at the Brooklyn one, that, that they, uh, um, it was a matter of not having enough people to maintain what need to be uh, maintained in, uh, in, uh, in that platform. Also, that platform needed to change a little bit because now any media was created in the, um, before social media. <coughs> Excuse me. And we need to bring that back. We need to move that back in some form, especially considering what social media, has been, um, one particular social media platform, has been trying to do to stifle us because they feel that free speech should only belong to Nazis. So, if we shouldn't really be relying on third parties for not just um, our networks, not just our reporting or anything, but as we're talking about mutual aid, that too. That too. When we're talking about looking out for our communities. We shouldn't have to go to um, government to, um, to do that. And um, that was what, that's what led me to be part of Occupy um, just 12 years ago. Because Occupy was trying to find those solutions to the problems that, that, that did not involve a political problem. And you know how effective we um, they thought that we were going to be because they chased us all out, they shut us all down, and then they were all about fighting for 15. You don't have to fight for 15. You can just buy it. You guys are the ones in government. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you protesting? <laughs> and um, and I think that's one of the things that makes us, makes us realize that um, we're on the right track, but we've got to stay on it. And we've got to display more track. So, uh, so I will just make sure that everybody understands that. I will make sure that everybody understands that um, at each event that I'm going to do um, for the book or for anything else I'm doing, we got to build our networks. Um, I should point out that um, while we're talking about CPAC in Hungary and uh, and basically they're going to have another CPAC in the United States um, in a couple of weeks. And, you see something even more nefarious when you start noticing that the white supremacy centers have been doing this too. There's a white, white nationalist um, website called Be There, and they bought a castle in West Virginia 
but it basically is going to be a cable car now. They're going to hold their conferences there. They're going to, net, they're going to be able to network with everybody. And they do this with another conference that I've been dealing with for years called the American Records Office. People from all over the country, all over the world, I'm sorry, all over the world, the network. And you see the fruits of that. You see the seeds of that. You see the down. But the folks in America, not the folks that be there, you will also see that feedback. And you will also see elected officials working with them. Steve King spoke at the last American Renaissance Conference. Then he became. I was trying to pretend he wasn't a racist back in the hour. Back when he was a congressman, um, he wasn't fooling anybody, but now the bail is left. And when you realize that you're dealing with that kind of power, when you realize that you have more power than they derive from, and we're not using it, that's when you say, okay, we got to fix this. Because perhaps, I mean, you bring this up quite a bit, it's time for us to have ourselves an international anti conference at some point. And I'm, hopefully, that point will be, be in the next. Uh, we're going to have to build our networks. We're just going to have to build our networks. I think before we take questions or ask uh, for comment, um, I'm kind of curious of what people are seeing, I guess, dark and light, but like, how are people seeing like, the far and the big and the little one? There are no actually high spots um, of organizing. But you know, like, the, the one thing that I think is interesting, this is what's been on my mind with it, is what are the other people attending regularly? Michelle, a woman of color speaking at an open white national. And by white national, we mean like race science, like really like kind of very explicit kind of stuff. Um, or we have folks like with the big doc, I read check, you know, a Hasidic Jewish woman, not again, that's not a conspiracy theory, just like you know, that's for us other things. Um, but basically, you're having folks that seem to be participating in their own dispossession to a certain degree, involved in these movements. Um, trans exclusionary radical feminists are getting like really, really kind of organized and becoming really aggressive violent towards so much so that a number of organizers who have been Communist Party organizers in the 70s, women that fought for reproductive justice, literally are now allying uh, with anti choice groups simply because they want to attack trans healthcare and access. So it's sort of like we're seeing a really weird fragmentation where they're literally recouping some of the folks and communities that they're targeting at the same time. Which creates a problem for us because it's hard. I mean, I think she was talking about, we're talking about colonial categories that are being projected out of their original context. So it makes it, I think, difficult. I know it's something you see now. Well, you see, when it comes to Michelle now, a dark skinned Filipino woman married to a Jewish man with two biracial children that had spent the past 30 years complaining about that person. And I'm, I, on, our, on our website, on one people's project at that time, we used to call them, call them the world's dark skinned white supremacists. And that was just tongue in cheek. She ran with it. Because now she is actually not just there speaking at the Congress, she's speaking at the Congress as a leader, a white supremacist leader. They, uh, she's part of the whole breaker movement, Nick Clinton's and all that. They look at her, her nickname amongst that crowd is Mommy. And you look at this and go, what the hell is wrong with you? And, and it's not just her, it's a lot. I mean, we've, we've seen, we've seen what kind of things going on with that. But it's not even about him, it's about a whole bunch of others of color that have been uh, embracing this. Uh, and my attitude has always been the fact that, um, you know, as we evolve, it's basically due to our success, as we evolve, as we become more and more a part of uh, communities and societies, integral parts, um, you're going to start dealing with a um, a generation that do not know the struggles of the past, do not know the struggles of police brutality. They grew up in the suburbs just like me. They became a nerd just like me, but they were the other way. Some of them are going to be right wing, okay. Some of them are fascist. Any positive things about Hitler? I mean, this is even happening in my family. I have to actually argue with family members about the chronicles of the others of dying. And I'm like, no. <laughs> But, it's, but it definitely does um, speak to how we, how we just uh, step up. In case you haven't noticed, the theme of uh, tonight has been pretty much application. And 
did it. I mean, I, I don't know uh, how many more times, I mean, more ways we can just reinforce the fact that if they're doing it, we're doing it. But we do it a lot better. <laughs> I just lost my train of thought. I forgot the question. <laughs> well, but I'm going to go quick. Because you said this, this piece about um, you know, reflection of our strength. And I think that's true. And I think the other main way that we see that is in the fact that um, we've made relatively impossible an actual open white nationalism as a broad you know, category. Right? And by that, I mean, I mean that's not a good thing. But I mean, there's a reason that these far right movements are taking refuge in you know in multi you know in multiracial movements. I mean in multiracial organizing the movements, putting forward representative color. There's a reason that they're trying to I mean the that there, there's an attempt to build a multiracial far right. And that's a response to the fact that they can't simply be a you know white party. There's a reason that Trump and Bannon, you know, uh, were trying to build, you know, develop a theory of economic nationalism um, to put forward white nationalism. Um, in, but in a way that, you know, the strategy, which is to sort of cut off 20% of Latinos, 20% of the black population, and then have a broad sort of, um, you know, relation back to support a white nationalist program. Right? And so to, to diversify in that way. And that's a part of the experience, right? I mean, you've got people you're talking about thinking about, like Charles Murray is like, probably, I mean, his great science now is <laughs> saying, well, first of all, he's like, look, I'm married to an Asian woman. And also, I think Asians are genetically superior to poor whites. So look, I'm not racist. Right? You know, so it's the same sort of real science with things with um, And I think that's a, a reflection of strength, right? And, and it's something that we need to confront on a higher plane because, because of the way we pushed it to that plane, right? And we made possible this reconfiguration of the right that we then need to sort of confront. And I think, you know, I, you know, I think we're getting better. Right? If we're talking about these, you know, the high points that are part of the question, right? The, the opportunities, right? Well, we're looking at the advancements that have been made. Again, the all right, the goal of the all right, alongside the multiracial sort of far right piece, was uh, a strategy of mainstreaming that downplayed the white nationalism in a way to sort of project into the mainstream. Right? This is why people like Richard Spencer Soro, Milo, were very dangerous um, as, as these sort of trophy forces that were able to maintain. <coughs> Still very dangerous, of course, but they failed. Right? And they failed because they were defeated, and they were defeated, especially in moments where anti fascists organized alongside more mainstream mass movements, you know, in particular to shut them down. Right? And the entire you know, whether it's in Berkeley or elsewhere, came together around a very broad coalition that remained anti fascists. Right? And I think those are the victories that have been won. Those victories then are projected forward into it. And I think we're in a moment of of course, downturn, counterinsurgency when it comes to policing, when it comes to uh, defunding. Um, but I think it's always important to recognize that there are victories built into what look like defeats constantly, right? When, when Joe Biden stands up and says we need to refund the police, I think we should also be remembering the fact that he needs to say that, right? He's right. saying that because of the real threat that a movement posed that forced defunding and abolition onto the agenda, and they're still trying to buy that back, right? Because they know that the, the next time things pop off, People will be ready with better arguments, better organizations, and better sort of um, knowledge of the terrain to project a real uh, abolition center. I want to inject something quick. Um, the trans inclusionary, um, I mean, most of them, many of them, they basically lost from folks who see themselves or see themselves And they were trying to uh, make, um, they were making an argument that, um, you know, what we've heard, right? um, these are men getting into women's sports and it's wrong and you know, all of this. <clears throat> and the fact that they did not, um, they went to straight to dehumanizing the um, trans community um, was a mistake. Um, there could have been discussions for real on that matter. There could have been, but they went to dehumanize it. And that brought in the right. They, the right saw an opening, not to just, not to just go after trans folks, but also restart that old hate engine that they had against the LGBTQ black community that we thought um, we destroyed 30 years ago. We thought that this was a settled thing. Nothing is settled with fash as we're learning. They're just laying in wait for an opportunity to come back. The person is going to be. Gave them this opportunity. 
a great tool. Now we're all fighting, not just for for What is it that we see? Who is it that we see standing outside with all these so-called mainstreamers as they try to shut down the grand shows? We see people straight up Nazis. We see um, Patriot Party. We see um, the Proud Boys, of course. We see um, uh, the White Lives Matter crowd. We see the National Social Club. Um, we see all these groups, and no one seems, it doesn't seem to bother those on the right. They're there. So now we not only see the um, LGBTQ plus community getting attacked, but we also see white supremacists, neo Nazis, getting legitimacy from folks on the right, from folks on Fox News and Newsmax, which, by the way, just got bounced off the right TV. And, uh, and all of these um, and all of these mainstream right wing outlets that just ten years ago wasn't even thought of. That's something that we need to bring up over and over again. They're not hearing from us about how much we are not going to do. So that's what I want to say. Hey, Father Daryl. I'm sorry. <laughs> to cut it to your time. Oh, you guys are just too good. Um, I guess I'll just focus on something. That kind of gives me a lot of hope and feels like a victory. It's, I guess, a little bit of a case study because it's not uh, as wide ranging as, as what y'all have been talking about. But I think about the changes I've seen within the heavy metal community over the past few years. And that's, but that's where I'm from. Like, I didn't, you know, I look like this for a reason. I pivoted. But um, when I was, I spent a really long time as a heavy metal music journalist. And growing up, I was one of the only girls then women at shows, and that was terrible. And those were shows that were still pretty white. And that has changed in the past few, past few years. Metal has never just been white dudes. It's always been diverse. The rest of us have always been there. But that has not necessarily been a comfortable place for the rest of us to be. And that's something that has changed over the past couple of years. Because a very explicit anti-fascist metal scene has really sprung up and gained ground and made real changes. Like the metal scene still has so many problems. Like it's like the, the punks and hardcore kids kicked out their Nazis back in the 80s. The heavy metal world like built them a whole like put out the welcoming wagon, basically. It's it's a complicated scene with a lot of issues. But there's been so many more vocally anti-fascist, anti-racist, like Pro queer, pro trans, pro liberation groups that have popped up in the past few years specifically, and they've gotten popular and they've been very vocal. They've played shows, they've gotten out there, they made it clear like this is not a space we're going to concede. We're not going to give up. Like this is ours too. Fuck Nazis, you're not welcome here. And you know, we, there have been applications. There have been a lot of shows and tours that have gotten canceled for bands that have no business playing to anybody. Like that's a newer thing that caused a lot of controversy in the metal scene, but a lot of folks realize that's the right thing to do. No quarter for fascists. We should not be paying, you know, paying ticket money to go see a bunch of Finnish Nazis sing about whatever it is they're saying in their complicated language. We don't want to hear it. <laughs> but that's just the thing I've seen. It just gives me a lot of hope as someone who grew up in the metal scene, spent a really long time in the metal scene, got a lot of hate for being, I guess, a little ahead of the curve. By being a lot of years ago, now it's it's just different. It's like there's not Pantera just reunited for some god of reason. I guess because too many too many weird dudes that fall behind on child support. So Pantera <laughs> reunited. But they and this is one of the biggest metal bands in the world still. They just got kicked off two major festivals in Germany because of the racist behavior of the Muslim the apologetic stance of the, the band is taken. Like, that's a big deal. That wouldn't have happened five or ten years ago. And I think that is because so many of the matches in the metal world have stood up and were like, you know what? This is our team. Like, we're not the punks in the 80s, but we're getting a little closer. And if our community with all of its issues, and all of the Nazis can do that, I feel like any subculture can. Like radicalize the yoga moms. You know? 
But there are so many different aspects of our society. Like we need these self selected groups where hatred is allowed to flourish because people don't want to deal with being held against it because oh, those are my people. Well, some of them aren't or shouldn't be. So if you want to make the world better for everyone, start in your own backyard. Bring them more home. Yeah, one of those, like, I think the front lines right now are attacks on trans healthcare and like, things like right on shoulder hour, but basically family trans opposite events, um, which needs to be our bottom line of self defense. It has to be that the front line. And while it's incredibly frightening, this is a level of attack that I think is actually quite new. It's like incredibly threatening. Um, and attacking people's actual access to healthcare uh, also is tied to actual legislative attacks, but like little physical attacks on facilities. Um, but like I was just with folks doing defensive actions in New York um, of tracking this era, and there were having huge crowds coming out and doing these block walls. Um, and people taking really militant action to defend them. And I'm not just talking about radicals coming out, I'm talking about radicals working with people's family members and stuff like that. So I think that's a really shining point, and I'm hoping that stays, stays in front of everyone's mind. So, any uh, questions or comments? Who and what you want to do with this massive, wide ranging anthology? Yeah, I take it. Um, I talked to all my friends and I said, <laughs> I mean, I think I like. That's the network, though. That's what Daryl was saying. Yeah. It's not that exists without the network that exists. I mean, it, it actually does feel more like a movement space than anything that before. Because I did talk to people that I've been organizing with, or that I had history with, or I had spent time with this, and said, like, what would you kind of produce if it was like a year Like, what would you kind of bring to it? And see if something, because it is a different way of doing it, and see, like, what would you bring to it, you know? And I think that came out in that way. So it felt like more of a conversation. Is there any further reading that you, I'm sorry, I'm just interested you. But I feel with a chill, which I fully respect. Is there any further reading you would recommend for folks that pick up this book, which you can do right up there, <laughs> and decide they want to dig deeper? Well, that we have reading by the people that talk about the panel here. So. <laughs> That's what I would actually recommend. Um, Gio has two new books. Uh, one of them is Big Fat, then. The World's Up, please, which is Big Fat. And then I could both have a call about labor. Um, I think both of their books actually touch on what we're talking about here. Because these are the foundations of the movement that we're talking about collaborating anti fascism. Um, and I think you can't really do that like we talked about without one, the mass movement, which labor is really the archetype in the you know, United like modern US context, and without police abolition. Uh, because you have a pure interplay between white militias and the police. So I think that's an essential piece of like a deeper understanding of it. What a fun historical career in Pennsylvania. I've been mean, thinking about this since you mentioned it. A fun, less terrible fact is that the Pennsylvania State Police, as Gio said, they were founded as the Coal and Iron Police, which is a private army that was hired out to crush a coal miner strike in anthracite regions. So whenever you think about unions and cop unions, just remember, especially here in Pennsylvania, they have never been on our side. Well, thank everyone for coming out tonight. Very um, Nicole and everything. Um, thanks so much, Kim, Gio, Daryl. Daryl's been coming to all around that. Um, <laughs> we just mash up and down the East Coast to get going. Uh, and thanks so much for being part of the book. Uh, it was a long journey. It was four years. Four years since you and I had a drunk conversation and said, "Hey, this would be really dope to do." Yeah. <laughs> I know. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Who came to us in that time? So. All right. Thanks so much, everyone.